Right, hello and thank you very much for the invite um, to speak at SEEDS 2021. Um, as a former, was a graduate of um, Leeds Beckett University and a former fellow of the Leeds Sustainability Institute. It's great to be back speaking here. Unfortunately, I'm currently stuck in Greece on holiday, which could be worse. So um, I'm here to talk a bit about um, nature-inspired innovation, biomimicry and cities. And um, you know from my bio that I'm the founder uh, of Biomimicry Innovation Lab. So, what is a city? Now, many of you live in the city, some people don't. We're turning into an urban populace, but really you can say cities, you know, it's a permanent densely settled place. We have administered boundaries. And we are moving into more service manufacturing instead of agriculture. It's in fact, it's a city, it's a large human settlement. But cities, in some ways, could say are alive. So they've got various interesting facets to them. They're alive, they're persistent, they are disequilibrated, they're dynamic, persistent again. They're very orderly and they're thermodynamic. Now, if you take cities by looking at the flows of materials, energies, information, you can see that people movements in from um, people moving in, recruitment, living there, births and deaths, materials, energy, services flowing in and services flowing out, as well as waste, heat, CO2, uh, and air, things like this as well. Because one of their interesting areas when you actually start thinking about a city is this concept of homeostasis. Does a city actually act in this way? So think about homeostasis is basically it's a stable equilibrium to two elements. Another way of looking at this is when you get cold, you shiver as your body's way to try and increase temperature. And when you get too hot, you um, sweat. So it's about actually are you, you know these physical processes and you find these in cities in nature as well but a city can also be taken in layers a bit like a cake some of the layers are harder to take you it's easier to change the elements at the top whether that's the top of buildings looking into the ways people move around cities then going all the way down digging deep into the um, settled infrastructure you know, the various layers in between there. So you could take everything from there, from the transport systems, underground system, roads, networks, buildings, parks, internal workings of buildings and roofs, and these kind of things as well. But it's enough talking about cities, and I'm sure everybody's travelled around the world, or at least um, these days with um, COVID, at least done a you know, poor man's holiday by going on Google Earth. But how do we actually start investigating this and start looking about, right, we've looked to... Um, a city. How do we look to somewhere different like nature and actually understand and take elements away from that to actually see how a city works? Now, with my background in urban design, urbanism, I'm a big fan of Jane Jacobs and her urban, urban commentary. And there's a great, great quote by her by the cities of human beings are as natural being a product of one form of nature as are the colonies of prairie dogs or the beds of oysters or you could talk about ants or termites or um, even flock of sheep or anything, just watching super organisms, so to speak, um, interacting. So now that we know that we're gonna be looking to nature and actually taking examples from there, how do we do it? So what is biomimicry or nature inspired design? To give you a couple of examples that, um, there's a company called Sharkfoot Technologies that look to shark skin and look to the ratios between the ridges and the mountains on shark skin to actually make a material that actually um, inhibits the growth of bacteria and viruses, even um, COVID and related coronaviruses. And they've now um, developed this technology. It's taken 20 years by looking at these ratios. And it's a material that's um, print, it can be manufactured and it can be put on various um, you know, high touch point surfaces around buildings and hospitals. But they've also got patents for catheters, contact lenses, they're looking into kids' toys, yoga mats, 
and endless possibilities. Other examples are by studying the super white properties and structural color of beetles. Um, startups are actually looking at um, replacing the chemical elements found in um, toothpaste and white paints and even in white brightening for um, clothing as well. Other examples are um, studying the streamlining properties of um, high performing um, fast fish such as the shelt sailfish which McLaren did by looking into different ways that they could actually align the, the surface skin of their uh, McLaren P1 as well as looking at um, increasing the air intake as well so reducing the amount of air so actually increasing performance. One of the great example is a bottle, um, one bottle company called Vitalis that actually make um, it's bottled water and they look to reducing the amount of material used in their bottle by um, having their designers studying um, specifically a white pine tree and how it actually grows and um, when it's reduced water and also in areas where there's high winds and actually it's using the same amount of material but actually making it stronger by looking at the structure. And finally, some other examples are by studying the exotic properties of animals, which you can actually, and, and plants, you can actually see by looking at cat skin or cow udders, it's, um, basically it's a high impact, it distributes the load. Um, you've got companies such as Nike are making shoes that don't need as much um, cushioning and actually distributing the load laterally instead of um, through into the person wearing them. We're seeing this in um, basically bomb suits and materials and medical applications as well. So really, what is biomimicry? Well, it's an innovative new way for problem solving. We all look around for ideas. So why not delve a bit further into the natural world that we look to anyway when we're looking for examples and taking these principles and analogies? So delving back into our company logo, I really see this as merging science, engineering, design and art together. So you're allowing yourself to swapping over between these disciplines with the, the science really at the hub. You're always delving back into understanding about how nature works, whether it's looking into your biochemical processes, the ecological frameworks and these kind of things, but understanding how you can tie all these different subjects together. Well, it really is, it's about how starting off by looking at systems and then process and then delving into functions. So yeah, systems, process and functions, and that's really how uh, we work. But if you start thinking about going back and jumping back up into cities, so you can start looking into energy, water, information and material systems and processes as well. So let's start thinking about, right, here's a process. It's not a food chain, this is a food web. So what eats what, what breaks down what, you know, you're talking about above, all the way from the um, primary and secondary predators, all the way up down, up and down into the soil and the plants. Now, how this relationship, basically it's the material and energy flow. So where can you see this? Now, this is not an example by a memory group, but this is an example where you can actually take these um, principles by developing matrices to see, you know, the greater biodiversity and alignment of species, you can actually then see how well or poor a um, industrial ecosystems performing or um, elements of manufacturing processes or cities or even business is there actually flowing by where's the information going where's the materials flow where's the energy is it transferred is there some waste that you can tap into that can be used for something else of say you know creating biochar uh, mini factories in the manufacturing process or examples by Things like British sugar growing hothouse tomatoes and medical grade marijuana by using excess heat and CO2. So it's really about taking this further and actually how many um, layers of, um, you can develop. So this is an example of food webs built in with the ecosystem services model that we're creating. It doesn't look like much, but the idea here is you can actually start understanding the flows going through and how can you um, business development actually be integrated into the natural world and you can understand where the health and well-being of you know the planetary health for the the well-being of um, animals the ecosystem as well as um, um human health as well when we start thinking more about these systems you can't help but then start delving into places like the vast areas of biodiversity 
So can you take these um, analysis of these systems and looking at the, um, basically the flows of energy and material by studying high biodiversity at areas like the Amazon rainforest, or even taking mangrove forests, but then not only looking at the mangrove forest, but also looking at the boundaries and the ecotone, or if you're a mathematician, um, or the, the fuzzy boundary between two areas. And you can see this not only just by the grand edges of that, but also where you've got areas of increased biodiversity by the edges of you know, forest clearings. So you're seeing the biodiversity and the transfer over there. What can we take from, what can we actually start by looking at the exchanges? Even delving into you know, more forests where you've got this water, but you've got these edges and the clearings as well. Now, one area that's been really fascinating me um, is actually the study of this single-celled um, organism. It's basically um, it's an amoeba. They, they group together in times of scarcity of food, but and then they start foraging for um, food, and they look at optimizing routes. And you can see this for logistics, for infrastructure. And this is a great example by a simulation that's been created by a company called Super Maneuver, where it's, what it's doing is it seeks out the food, and this is based on rule-based um, scenarios and where it finds food it strengthens the connections where it doesn't and you can run these simulations very very quickly even using examples of actually using actual uh, dog vomit slime mold itself to do this or you um, can create algorithms to do this as a simulation other areas of exploration is looking at termites so um the classical way, if you can call it that, of studying termites is actually looking at the construction, how termites build, but also you can start looking at the prairies as well. And um, mathematicians and biologists have found that actually the boundaries between termite mounds is between five and seven neighbours, which averages out at six. So is it hexagon? Well, it's not quite because it's 5.99 repeating. Um, but these days, instead of rounding up and that, you know, summarizing it, we can stick to that. But the key thing about that there is it's, it's creating the, the right conditions where there's less likelihood of actually two colonies battling it out for food. So they've, the boundaries are actually determined on how much food because they correct the, especially the termites like this location in Namibia are actually collecting um, food, not for themselves, but for the fungus they coexist with. And the fungus them, they feed the fungus that breaks down the plant matter, which then they eat the fungus. So there's um, you know mutual relationship. And there's a clear example of how the mounds look. We're zooming in a bit further. And then a very much a white mound here, which looks like it's got very much calcium deposits. If anyone's old enough, it could all just be like a giant 1980s dog poo. But when you actually start looking inside the termite mines, this is where you're seeing the homeostasis because these termites are continually building and it's a breathable membrane, the, the um, external walls of the termite mound, and these are continually adapting it because they want a certain percent, 80% humidity, and um, the temperature fluctuates because they're actually stacking, not a stacking effect like we get in architecture, but the, the flow changes depending on the um, heating effect of the air moving around to control the community. So they're continuously building and repairing and changing it. And the skin of the uh, termite mound is also porous, allowing CO2 to escape and oxygen to um, suck in at night. So I mentioned some of the areas there. So one of the key areas that we also study, instead of looking at the physical design, is actually study of thermodynamics. And this is about the transformation of energy into useful form of work. Those of you who can remember from school or learning from um, Chris Gorse and some of his talks that he gives. So this is a great quote when you start looking into thermodynamics, that it's a funny subject. You think you get it, and then you don't understand it, and then you think you understand it, but you miss some points, and then the third time you go through it and you, you realise you don't understand it, but then it doesn't really bother you anymore. But it's actually a very interesting way, especially some of the um, laws of thermodynamics, especially the second law, which is talking about heat transfer, uh, the energy transfer. Because one of the areas we've been looking at is entropy. And entropy is a, basically the way that, um, you know, creating 
order from disorder. So you go from high entropy, which is disorder, into low entropy. There's a lot of energy to be done that, but this is also formed in a boundary. So the building is the boundary. And outside that is chaos. But as a city, can a city be low entropy? Well, it's, it sounds doesn't sound as sexy as a circular economy, so circular city, but that's in essence what a low entropy city is aiming for. But it's proving the point that you could never actually hit true circular with everything keep be kept enclosed within a city. Because if you go back to the previous diagram I showed, there's always going to be some transient movement. We don't live in a closed city loop system, you know, where everything from the heat bouncing off our buildings, or in my case, bouncing off my head back into space, you know, the CO2 that I'm breathing out from any animals, we're not capturing that unless we live in a giant dome. Um, and even then, it's some of it's bounced into space, so we, we're not part of a closed si system. So researchers, um, Pelosi um, and uh, their team have been developing this. this is an interesting model that they're actually looking at, can we look into biochemical processes with effectively green infrastructure to take a, away from a high entropy city to actually a low entropy? Can we build these infrastructure components in that actually allow the transfers of energy and then um, working within the laws of thermodynamics? So we're not having as much waste pollution and CO2 coming out. We're always gonna have some, but it's about looking at where you can capture the energy throughout the city. And it's very, very similar to other models from donut economics, but it's about understanding and connecting the flows. It's one of the areas um, that we've been working on too, and this is just a case study we're developing for this, is informal settlements. So 25% of the world's population live in informal settlements. And since 1990, 213 million more people have um, been forced to live in informal settlements. And these people have no security of tenure. They live in geographic, environmentally sensitive areas, which are more likely to, because they don't, they don't have any ownership of the land, that they can get very quickly cleared off of that, if anyone's seen any um, of the stories of the past couple of years in the news from um, South Africa. Also areas that are likely to um, very high levels of drought or flooding. But there's a number of factors that you need to consider as well if you actually can, how do you work with these because a lot of um, agencies, governments as well, only just now started acknowledging that they exist and that instead of getting rid of them, we need to actually understand that there's always going to be a flow of people coming in, especially in the future mega cities that we're going to see in the global south. So we need to consider areas such as population growth and how that links to rural urban migration, the lack of affordable housing, which we're even seeing in the UK, could COVID cause a, a mass informal settlement growth in the UK, who knows? Weak governance, um, which you can see a lot of in certain cities. I'd recommend reading some work by um, Ren Koolhaas when he was um, working at Harvard. Um, and they spent eight years studying um, Lagos and how it ran, the city actually effectively ran itself without um, any governance structure. Tying into low paid work, the vulnerability, economic vulnerability tied into that, and then displacement. And we're seeing a lot, you know, you're going to see a lot more climate refugees or displacement examples, what's happening now in um, Afghanistan. So for those, those of you who are not familiar with informal settlements, there are certain areas, some of them are more planned than others. An example, we're working on a an area in Cape Town with the South African Space Agency in a company called Co-Location, um, just in case you didn't know where Cape Town is. We're zooming in, it's just next to the Cape Town International Airport. In this area, it looks like a bit like a block of cheese. Um, it's called Barcelona. And they named it Barcelona because they realized, well, we're completely just cut off from anything that's like South Africa. So we, the residents decided to name it after somewhere in Europe. Now, this is very, very much an unplanned settlement. Um, and it's got the, there's about two and a half thousand toilets dotted around that have been put in partially by the residents, uh, the city and NGOs. But when you look at the actual urban grain, you see it is a random set of people. It's almost a battle between um, the creation of the roadways, um, where people live, where the toilets are, access points as well. 
So our further study and what we're doing is we're going to be looking at um, basically the thermodynamic flows, the entropy, where does the material come from? What is the battle? How is this self-organized as a place to live? What's changes and how is this different, this site with a population where it's higher density than Paris, even though it's only single stories, where can we make the lives better for these people? It's a human centered approach. What is what are the things that are working, such as, you know, people access points? Can we get in emergency services? Is there enough water points? Is there safety? Is there lighting? Is there enough toilets? Is there access to any other provisions? What happens when certain waterways do they flood? Is it in a flood plane? Can we actually build a model that actually predicts changes over time by going and doing a, effectively a regression analysis by looking back? At various other of those factors, if you consider this um, moving forward. Now, yes, a lot of other people have been doing this when you see work of um, Santa Fe Institute, uh, University of Chicago and Harvard, but it's very much, they're very much studying this as kind of an automated thing about root flows. And in some ways they're ignoring the human aspect because then the day these are created because of, you know, initiatives or lack of initiatives by us, and it's for those people there and not just about the buildings, it's about the lives of people there. So how do we move things like this forward? Now one area is um, we've been developing and you can see, well, it's tied into Industry 4.0 is, yes, you can use um, AI software connecting all this together, but using it in the right place for places like Cape Town, you wouldn't go in there with um, technology because well, it's just rude to do that. I've heard Harvard are going in there with VR headsets. I think that's completely wrong. But it's like about connecting. How do you understand and connecting the biological, this, the, the internet of things, so to speak, and the physical together? How can you build all this of using the information for safe and open data? Connect that. Could we have, you know, trees as a service, waterways as a service? So you're tying into kind of blockchain and understanding that everybody's tying into this. Can we have very micro sensors? Because most people there will have mobile phones. How do they actually, can they be part of the um, solution by helping with you know, micro, you know, they get paid for every time they upload a picture that actually helps with some research. Use micro payments for actually improving the lives of themselves there instead of just their mobile phones and their social media actually being just tied into, you know, making money for others or sending people into space and rockets that look very much like a phallic shape. So but we're kind of at a crossing roads with biomimicry where we really do understand that our computers and our models are actually allowing us to understand from AI that's looking into, you know, um, basically, neuroscience and um, understanding of developing, going all the way down to the quantum level, we're understanding how things work. So just to summarize, what are the three takeaways from this? Well, it's very much, instead of just looking at, right, how does something function? Look at the processes, you can see them happening in front of you. You can see how things change. You can see how they've adapted, how are they interacted with the external world? What's shaping that? What's um, making it worse, what's making it better and mapping those out and looking at those interactions is that what the relationships there, what the trade-offs. Key thing here is we were understanding the context. Yes, it's all right to maybe start looking at these metaphors, but understanding that you've got to build this complexity up as well, because you know, just by something looks similar doesn't mean to say actually it's contextually right, because as humans, we're very, very good at looking at patterns. You know, we've done that ever since childhood, done always staring at clouds and seeing elephants and dogs and whatever else um but how is that similar it's the same thing of like looking at city network and comparing it to the growth of the solar system they look similar but the processes are completely different and far, finally spend some time looking at thermodynamics of the urban realm and how that then connects into the rural as well because that, that is a great way and this is an ongoing project we're uh, very much focusing on is what energy flows, what's material, and down to information and all these different flows, can they be the ones that you can actually start understanding? Because what is the carrying capacity of a city? Because most of our cities are going to have to grow as we grow as a population. So just to yeah, finish off, 
So yeah, watch how things grow, adapt. How are they self-organizing? How are they adapting? You know, it's a bit like planting seeds and watch them grow. You, you're seeing all that massive amount of energy using very, very um, quickly. The amount of energy in you know the, the early stages of growth of plants, you know, watching um, immature forests growing or tiny forests and things like that as well. And you can see how these changing, adapting until they become a mature ecosystem and habitat. So this really sums up biomimicry the way we work. If you want to make small changes, change the way you do things. And if you, you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. And that really is, in essence, biomimicry. Okay, thank you very much for having me.